In today's conversation, I speak to Jake Sassville about how to create from a place of surrender, not hustle. We discuss the difference between coping and disassociation and the journey that he has taken to commercial success and the lessons that he can now share. Also shares with us how he stepped in as CEO during COVID when the company was in a tailspin. In two years, he turned it around, achieved seven-figure revenue in year one, became profitable, doubled revenue in 2022 and he sold out for two years into 2024. This is a personal conversation of loss, transition and courage that becomes transformed into practical steps that lead to success. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today our guest is Jake Sasserville. How are you doing, Jake? Good to see you, Judith. Good to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good that you're here to wow us with all your expertise. Oh, boy. The expectations have been set in the first 10 seconds. Here we go. (laughs) Well, only the best, Jake. Only the best. So tell me who you are first. Wow. There's there's the philosophical question of the century. Who am I? That uh, that's actually a um, a meditation cue that I used to use when I lived on Maui, studying mm-hmm. Ramana Maharshi, uh, who was an Indian uh, an Indian meditator. Who am I? And fundamentally, the mind cannot answer that, um, and so it just allows you to go deeper and deeper into meditation. Anyways, the three D answer, the kind of non woo woo answer. Who am I? I guess. You know, I play different roles. I see them as roles, um, which allows me not to take life too seriously. I'm the CEO of Imaloa Institute. Uh, I'm a friend, brother. Um, I would say entrepreneur since I was very young. Uh, a, a traveler, explorer, not an avid traveler as in I need to hit 150 countries before I die, but just genuinely curious and open about the world and the people that live here. And um, yeah, I used to be a magician. I used to be on television. That was a role roles that I used to play. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And what did you do on TV? So when I was very young, I hosted a late night chat show on ABC after Jimmy Kimmel, and I was the youngest host ever in America uh, in late night TV. Um, And so I hosted a kind of a hybrid reality talk show that I created, executive produced, co-wrote, and uh, and like I said, start in. And I was 21, and I looked after a team of 40 people in the, we, we based ourselves in Tribeca in New York City. And it was You know, looking back, as you start to look back on your life, I'm 37 now. It's just, it's like, oh, look at that. That was a different, that was a chapter. That was a, that was a kid trying to be loved and acknowledged and appreciated. And, um, and that's the way that I sought to be able to do it. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a fun chapter. It was actually really fun. It was fun because I failed so fast, so often in those days in my twenties even though it didn't appear to look like failure to most people. For me, it was just like inner angst and failure and not really sure where I fit in. And I feel like that because it happened so fast and so furious and so often that I learned so many jewels that I'm able to now, you know, I I picked up so many jewels that I'm now able to apply in my thirties. And as I, as I careen toward my (laughs) forties, Wow. I mean, 21, that's absolutely amazing. And, you know, after Jimmy Kimmel as well, I mean, that's that's something to uphold, isn't it? What did you learn from that period? You know, I learned, well, because I wanted it so badly, I recognized that when in life we want something so badly to work, sometimes that can actually be the reason why we're pushing it away. Mm. And yeah, and so what I chucked that down to, and I only got this in hindsight, not when I was doing it. When I was doing it, it was crazy. I was closing six and seven figure ad deals. I was hosting the show. I was executive producing it. I was working with people that were, you know, three times my age, um, two and three times my age. 
Um, so yeah, it was, it was really interesting. I would say what I learned is more to live life on life's terms. Um, and to be able to create, and this was eventual, not when I was actually doing the show in my twenties, but to create from a place of surrender instead of hustle. I had hustled my face off for the better part of my teens and twenties. And I eventually lost it all because that pattern just was not sustainable. Um, and it, it, it was of all things, a hurricane, hurricane Sandy, that kind of took everything, kind of stripped everything away in 2012, literally washed my house away uh, in New York city. But this idea of learning to create from a place of surrender instead of hustle really transformed my life because I think that a lot of people, um, you know, create from a place of self will, I'll do this, I'll create the results, I'll condition myself. And I learned a bit of a softer way because I had gone so hard for so long. Hmm. Gosh, I don't imagine what it must be like to come home and find your, you know, your home washed away, literally with all your possessions and stuff in it. How did you manage to pick yourself up and keep going? You know, I, my brother died when I was very young, Judith, I was 17 and he was 13. And so I've actually learned to compartmentalize things probably a little too well. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I've been, I've been really looking at that through different modalities now in my late thirties um, in terms of compartmentalizing and conflating and kind of keeping things in their own sort of tidy box so that nothing spills over. So the hurricane and Sandy, so I was away. Uh, I was actually speaking. I was doing a speaking engagement at the David Letterman lecture series at his alma mater, um, literally as water was washing inside the house, October 29th, 2012. And I remember just being texted updates you know, okay, we have one foot of water, two feet of water, three feet of water. Okay, four feet of water, we're evacuating. Uh, it was my my uh, roommate at the time. And so I, I got delayed. I couldn't fly back to New York City from Indianapolis for a while. So it wasn't, I, I was just able to compartmentalize things. I think, you know, trauma early on in one's life, um, and, and I don't use that word lightly, and I also don't use it to describe things that happened. I usually use trauma in the sense that Gabor Mate, Dr. Gabor Mate uses trauma, which is, it's not the thing that happened, it's the people that were around you at the time that were supposed to look after you and take care of you, that they weren't able to host whatever what was what was happening. Uh, mm-hmm. That to me is where traumatic experience occurs when people around you uh, are unable uh, or unwilling to host what is happening to to host the emotion of that. That's where the trauma really kind of leads into the experience. The, the point of this is that I think dealing with trauma so early on in my life that these these things that would happen almost felt like fodder for the story. So they didn't bother me in the way that normal things would have bothered. And and I think that that was because I was acutely able to like deny things and pretend like that they didn't exist or weren't happening because the mission or the goal was often so important to get the TV show on, get it funded, uh, get out of the bankruptcy. Once I went bankrupt, the 22, you know, that whole thing. So like hurricane washing away a house, eh, I'm not there. I'm physically safe. I'll find another house was kind of my approach. Now, these days, it has its pros and cons when you're able to to compartmentalize like that. And on one hand, you're able to move forward. And most people are completely just on the ground and unable to function. And at the other, you know, on the other side, it's uh, worthy of an exploration of, huh, am I, am I tuned in, tapped on with my emotions? Do I actually, can I actually process what's happening or am I just, you know, walking around emotionless? So that's been the journey of mine, but that's, um, yeah, that's the hurricane. Wow. That's, that's so much. Thanks for sharing about that. I, I wonder, I think what you ended up saying at the end was quite interesting because there is that line between your coping or, or you're disassociated. And I think it's quite interesting that you was aware of that early on so that you can stay on the right line of that. So I know the, in during COVID, you decided to step up as C, CEO in, is that your own hospitality business or someone else's? Yeah. So Imaloa Institute in Costa Rica is a vision that I had had 
um, that with a lot, along with a few others, I was able to bring forth and create it. And it's really a, um, a retreat center. It's an education center, a learning center um, inside a hospitality business inside what feels like a national park in Costa Rica. So there's a lot of different things happening, but yes, at its core, it's in, in the transformation business and hospitality business. Mm -hmm. So you decided to be the CEO when the company was actually tail spinning out. Is probably is that because people weren't traveling? So therefore it's losing money. Oh, it was, it was unfortunately a lot worse than that. So, Imaloa started in June of 2018, mm. and we completed construction in April of 2019. So we were just rounding out almost our first full year in operations um, when COVID came in March of 2020. And not only did it prevent people or were people not traveling, the borders actually closed March of 2020, March 18th specifically, a day that will live in infamy, Judith. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, the March 18th is when the borders close. And I had 30 plus contracts of retreat hosts and sold out retreats uh, that were upcoming that we had to dance around, which I know everybody had to change things. I mean, I'm certainly not alone in this. And I had two co founders So the borders shut for what would be seven months. And both my co-founders who served as CEO and COO, I was more the marketing sales visionary guy. Uh, exited the company during that time. It was extremely tumultuous. We were locked down in Costa Rica, which actually felt quite free. I pivoted the company. We pivoted the company to be a long-term like live-in workspace. So if you were stuck in Costa Rica, you could pay us monthly and we would feed you gourmet food. You'd get an accommodation. You'd get a beautiful community of people and you'd get to be able to work because we had fiber optic internet. So that's really what saved us. And all, as this was going on, everything was kind of crazy. And, you know, it was just a crazy time um, in the States and around the world. And yeah, two of my partners at the time exited the company in, in you know, in the way that they chose to exit the company. And basically the investors of Imaloa said that if you don't step up as CEO, we're going to have to sell. This is not going to work. And I said no three times. You know, oftentimes when opportunity comes knocking for something that is an edge for us, I have learned, you know, we say no, we reject the call. And that's certainly what I got, got real good at doing. I said, well, I'm a college dropout. What's the matter with you? I, I'm like the visionary, crazy sales marketing guy. I never saw myself as CEO of this company. It was daunting. And I saw just the challenges that my predecessor and ex-business partner had in CEOing it. And um, you know what got me, Judith? I'll tell you what got me is that one of the investors is also a friend of mine. It has become a very good friend of mine. And he really coaches. He coaches high-end public companies and their leadership teams on um, oftentimes somatics. And that is... The, the overall idea, whether or not your listeners agree or disagree, is that it's not your brain that's running the show. It's actually your body informing the brain. And the challenge that we have in life is that we think it's emanating from our brain, but it's actually, it's, it's starting from the body. It's like uh, in that book that Bessel van der Kolk wrote, The Body Keeps the Score. And so he really invited me through this journey. And I just remember being in tears. Like I, I just, it was, I, I was on top of a mountain in the middle of Costa Rica. My partners were exiting like, and he would coach me to go into the body, not to think about it, but where do I feel it? And I'd be like, this is ridiculous. But after a few times of talking, I realized the emotions that I was, that I thought that I was feeling or thinking or whatever, the rage, the anger, the sadness, it actually was stored in my body. And once I was able to feel into that and do nothing other than just acknowledge that it was there, something started to transform in terms of what I saw was possible for myself. And mm -hmm. that connection with somatics uh, and my body really truly holding the emotion rather than it being all in my head, not only started to settle my nervous system, which had been very activated in fight or flight for years at that point, really until recently, but it started to also give me clarity. And that clarity brought me to an awareness that I couldn't be CEO, but I could be interim CEO. 
I could be interim CEO. And of course, interim CEO turned into full, full-time CEO. Uh, we brought the company profitable within 14 months of saying yes. And you know, we recently restructured things with three new investors, exiting 36 investors. And you know, the company has really turned, turned, to, turned to leaf, turned to new leaf. Um, and the people there, the team, the experience, the clients were sold out now for two years. So it really shifted and it had everything to do with me being willing to go into my body and figure out where the emotions were rather than trying to figure everything out in my head. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That's something that people don't normally think about. How is it different going into your body rather than your head? I really appreciate the questions. I never talked about this stuff and I've, I've rarely talked about the journey between the head and the heart or the head and the body. You know, look, I think what we believe, so we believe, I think human beings often believe those who are not really in the study of somatics and I'm not in the study. I've just been the unintentional beneficiary of this work. We have the grandfather of this work who pioneered this work, Dr. Peter Levine, who's 81 coming to Imaloa next year to teach for 10 days. And he's the guy that pioneered everything 60 years ago in relationship to the somatic work. So for any listeners who are hearing me tell stories and kind of opining, I suggest you go to the source, people like Dr. Peter Levine, Bessel van der Kolk, Dr. Gabor Mate. For me, I can share my own personal experience. The difference, I think your question was, of the head, I, we believe that our bodies are downstream from the head, that we think it first and then we feel it. And what this work suggests, according to my understanding, is that we have to feel it first and that that actually changes the neurochemistry of the brain. Now, there's often an unwillingness because we're so disconnected from our bodies, which is why we do so many different practices at Imaloa from ecstatic dance, which is very embodied, you know, it's very physically embodied. You have to get in touch with your body. Um, cacao ceremonies. Cacao is the indigenous plant of Costa Rica, of many indigenous tribes here and of Central America. And it's really as a heart opener. It's not caffeinated, what people think normally, um, because of the cacao bean is unroasted. I mean, I'm going into different sections now, but different areas. But so we do all these things so that we can start to reconnect with our bodies in a way like the Western world has not allowed us to. You mentioned that you had a, a tooth situation. It's like really looking into, Judith, what that tooth situation represents for you. And I, it's this is not a therapy session. I'm not a therapist, but I'm saying that in my experience, connecting with these different facets, realizing that the body is what's keeping the score and the head is just trying to keep up. Whereas we think that because we think it, I think therefore I am, right? Descartes said, because we think it, that there's a, that there's a, um, you know, that, that we're somehow in charge of what everything happens. If I think my disease away, if I, if I put enough intentionality, if I say enough affirmations, and not to say that those things don't serve and have a purpose, but in my own personal experience, I've just recognized that really diving into the body and how it feels before you even, or as you're thinking, but redirecting the, the thoughts into really tapping into how you feel, it it just allows, for me, it's allowed me to make better decisions. It's allowed me to heal the wounding of the past. Remember the, the trauma that we talked about before, um, where you, you have needs that go unmet by people who were supposed to be there for you when you were experiencing things. When you do this kind of work, you get to actually be the parent that maybe you didn't have at the time when you were a young kid and the patterns have continued playing out. So it just opens a whole world of possibility of looking at things uh, in, in a different light. Yeah. I've never talked about this stuff and I just love that you're kind of extrapolating and we're having a conversation about it, Judith. <laughs> I like to go wherever the conversation goes, where my own curiosity levels go. Let's listen to a quick advert. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer and the leading authority on Maverick leadership. She is the founder of The Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities, and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist 
and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international and trade press. Welcome back to The Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. Thinking about what you're saying, and I've always felt that the mind, body, soul is all connected Mm. and different times you choose which one takes preference. So, for example, sometimes I might be working with someone, mentoring someone, and they've got, um, say, part confidence might be something they're coming up, and you've done everything cognitively. You know, they can Mm. do well, you understand the reasoning, and it's just, for some, it just, it's not working, right? (laughs) So Uh get, get what you're saying, but it's not working. And sometimes you say, right, look, okay, in this situation, and then you start talking about the body, like you said, right, so you might want to anchor them into a feeling or into something visual. Mm. Uh, Sometimes people I've actually said, right, stand up and actually put them in confident poses. Mm. And then it makes the brain work. But I think, for me, I think, because we all access those resources in a different way and we all have a preference that it's more, mm. I think it's the more the willingness to jump to different ones if if in that time that serves, as opposed to saying it's always the body that's driving or it's always the mind that's driving. I think maybe the problem you're talking about is people who aren't flexible and believe there's only one way. So they can't mm. cognitively. So like, for example, I do a lot of um, cognitive work with people, but there are times when maybe because there is real bad trauma that you can't talk about it. So there's Mm. other methods like via stories, other ways to get to the unconscious. So they can move, but I don't need to know what they're processing. Mm. And they can deal with the work without cognitively having to think about where the trauma came from. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think it's, so I don't know. I think for me, it's not, and it's just a different view, but I just don't think it's particularly rigid i think it's about the right it's like the right tool for the right situation Mm. yeah i'm reminded of the work that i've done personally and have brought people to do here in costa rica with the horses Mm. um and what's called efl equestrian facilitated learning it's a very particular type of horse therapy that is taught by a school out of arizona and it's deeply moving and Oftentimes, the facilitator does not need to know what trauma is coming up to be cleared or whatever it is that the heart math, that the heart, well, the heart math and the, the, the vortex of the horses and the herd brings stuff up. And I've seen it again and again with the biggest uh, naysayers or question mark people, people who are like, these horses are not going to choose, you know, because the whole thing is that you get like an hour of education on what the horses are going to do then you go in the thing it's on five acres of land and then a horse chooses you and people are like a horse is not going to come up and choose me thank you very much i mean i brought scientists up there i brought cognitive therapists and sure enough a horse literally walks right up to you nose to nose and chooses you and then that's the horse that you're working with for the day or whatever it is and just the power of being able to be witnessed uh, in this way that doesn't require you to talk it out or talk it through. I love that you're applying different concepts to the people that you coach and mentor and work with. Uh, I think that's really important to meet people where they're at because that gives them a feeling of safety and security. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think it's, I don't know. I'm sort of the person that says, what do you want to get out of it and let's find the best way to do that rather than mm. saying I have a solution that looks like this and this is the one we're going to wear today mm-hmm. I just don't think that works really particularly well I'd rather a mm. tailored suit than something off the off the um, rack I think when I'm working with people but uh mm. fitness just as I say it's a willingness to be open and to recognize the stuff that we don't know if you think about it um before we started humanity started vocalizing we were communicating in other ways right so the fact that we don't communicate in those ways doesn't mean that we're no longer capable i mean if you think about no you don't really do uh roundabouts in a, in america but it always fascinates me like in the uk you come to a roundabout and there's a set way you know you look to the right and those on the right has you know has a priority but there are times you come to the roundabout 
at the same time as everybody else. So who goes first? And somehow mm. people just look at each other and then it just happens. No one's no one's given away, no one's said anything, but everybody knows who is going to go. And you know there's mm. no car. So there's some sort of like telepathic link that we've accessed without realising it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we're sitting at the roundabout, no one moving, or we've all crashed. And mm-hmm. yet people do it every day and just don't think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, so I think we just need to, you know, as humans, realise that there are many ways to communicate because, you know, body language. And, and how many times do you listen to a piece of music and cry or you walk past something and smell it and, it, and you smile because it reminds you of something? I just think we just need to be open to all our senses and those senses that are, as you said, in the body. Um, you know, you've, just, you've just given three explanations, Judith, of why the body does actually keep the score. I mean, you're talking about the 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 kind of the invisible link at the roundabout, the the music and how that activates something, and how the olfactory nerve, the the smell activates. That's all. It's all stuff coming up and emanating from the body doesn't sound like there's a lot of cognition going on in the examples. I mean, certainly after the fact, Oh my gosh, I remember this or that when they smell something or, you know, obviously I was talking about the roundabout, but it's, you're, you're making a pretty good case for how the body kind of (laughs) (laughs) connects. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we know things on a subconscious level, but how we process them is different. It's a bit like, um, Mm. it's a bit like NLP and someone will say, you know, they're trying to anchor something, and so they'll go through all the different senses. But for me, certain senses are way so strong that the other senses don't really, I don't really notice them. I have to notice them by thinking about it. Uh-huh. And it always infuriates me when people say, no, 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 that can't be true because you need to be able to, do-. and it's like, well, probably, but over my history has meant that I've spent X amount of years focusing on X, Y, Z um, senses. So they're the ones that are primary hit and they and they they work and they're easier. So I'm going to stick with that. Mm, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, that it's that recognition that whilst, yes, obviously, you know, your brain's picking up that you're sitting on the chair and all the rest of it. But if it's not, if it's not, if you're not hurting, Mm. For some, the fact that you're sitting on the chair, you don't need to. It doesn't matter if if, it, if you're, um, I don't know, if the chair's comfortable. If it's not, if you're focused on something else, do you sort of mean? Mm. I just think. Mm-hmm. I need to be, well, like I'm rambling now, so I'm going to move. Mm. On. <laughs> no, I'm right there with you. I understand. It's just an interesting thing. So you, so you took over a CEO. You completely. I love the way you changed the business because at its core, it's still hospitality, but you just gave it a different purpose. Um, yeah. For, for while the borders were closed. I mean, I think we were all trying to figure out how to pivot and everything, you know, it was a time that all of us had to do that. Not just, not just me, but yes, it, it, it still very much lived out its core values as a business mm. while figuring out a different way to remain a business we were the only place judith the only place in our zone in our area of the country um that stayed open and did not fire a soul and i'm pretty pleased by that i mean everybody else shut down or at the very least fired people gosh and are you still maintaining the same business since covid have you gone back to what you was doing before yeah, no, we, were, we we went back the minute that the borders opened, we started to book retreats again. So we are doing retreats. We're sold out for a year and a half now doing retreats at Imaloa. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, it was just a temporary thing at the time. It taught us a whole lot. But yeah, no, we're back hosting the world's top transformational leaders now. And then they bring their people and we bring our people. And it's uh, it, it's a beautiful thing. It's like a new you know, it, we may just be pioneering a new method or a new environment for education and, and training. And, um, you know, it's still early to tell, but it certainly feels like we're on, we're, we're doing something in the direction of returning people to themselves, to nature, to food, to experience that the world seems to be getting away from as we go into AI and automations and, 
you know, busyness and technology that there, you know, there seems to be a craving, a desire for something a bit more simple. Let's listen to a quick advert. As a leader, you know that having a strong level of influence is essential to achieving your goals. But how do you know if you're truly making an impact? Take the How Influential Are You scorecard to get a clear picture of your current level of influence and identify areas for improvement. With personalised recommendations and valuable strategies, you'll be able to amplify your influence and make a real difference as a leader. Don't miss this opportunity to improve your leadership skills. Take the scorecard now at amplifyyourinfluence.scoreapp.com. Welcome back to The Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. Thanks for that. You know what? I've been thinking about this AI thing for some time now. Um, Mm. Months and months and months thinking what would, in fact, I think probably at least a couple of years thinking... Where I sit thinking, right, you know, is what I do useful um, if something happened? Do you know what I mean? It's like, mm. if it's a catastrophe, is it still useful? And if it's not useful, why am I doing it? And it's a question that keeps me going a lot of the time, um, just to make sure that, that what I'm constantly doing is something of use. And the uh-uh. thing... And I've been thinking about AI, especially, you know, generative AI, thinking the only way to survive in an AI world is to be more human. Mm -hmm. Because they won't Mm -hmm. out-human the human. It might out-think the human, out-dance the human, out-rap the human, but, you know, in our essence of our humanity, it's not going to outdo us. Oh, wow. Do you know what I mean? And I'm just sort of thinking, what does that, so I'm sort of thinking in my head, what does, what does it mean to be human? human? Yeah, and, and how do I bring that into the people I work with and the organisations I work with? And what can I do to help others be more human whilst mm. maintaining my own purpose and mission and, and stuff like that? And I just think, as you said, it's just, go, like say, the retreat is, is good and there are other things we need to do around how we as humans think and connect because as much as we are moving into a world where we're going to eventually have AI physically in front of us and Mm. us uh, conversing with it and maybe even going out with them, what are we Mm. going to do to make sure that doesn't let us die inside? Mm. So so these are the things that are are keeping me going. And (laughs) and I was just thinking, um, as you say, what you made the change you made two quite quick changes one through COVID and one reverting back what did you how did you communicate that to your staff or how did you market those quick changes to to potential customers so that you was able to say become sold out for two years and double your revenue well, so keep in mind, there was the pivot, which was the live and work, kind of come here to live and work. And that was one set of things. And then um, and, and then actually returning to our core business model and strengthening it was after the borders opened in 2021. Um, and I guess now we're in 2023, although the whole, the last four years, three years still feels like one, doesn't it? Sometimes mm-hmm. it's like, oh, what year was that? Um you know, I did not. So as all the changes were happening at Imaloa, uh, when I when my partners were leaving and I was stepping in, I was so frazzled and frenetic um, that one of the biggest mistakes that I made that my team taught me was I didn't disclose, for example, why my partners were leaving. Mm. Um, and we were a very close team. We were all living together during COVID to give you an idea because we were a hospitality business. So we had extra rooms in addition to those that we were selling and doing the live and work thing. So we were all kind of living together. The team was coming up the mountain. So it was like a very tight knit thing. And instead of like oversharing or sharing anything at all, I decided you to, to just need to know basis and um, just kind of keep it from the, from the senior team on the ground terms of what was really happening, because the reason that I had justified this was I didn't want to make my ex-business partners, um, I didn't want to defame them in any way. I didn't want to share what was really happening. 
um, because I thought, I guess, deep down that I would be hurting their reputation. I didn't want them. I already was so upset with them as ex-business partners that I didn't want my own upset to um, permeate and, you know, discolor their reputation in front of the team, which had also grown grown, grown close to them, even though I was stepping in and taking taking CEO position. Um, so this was a delicate balance because I really got feedback from the team after that, which was, you know, you don't have to keep this stuff from us. And I think it goes back to the unmet needs and wounds from childhood, right? That I've, that I've been working through, which, which is the trauma that I've been working through, which is that it was never safe to fully be who it is I was when I was growing up. And so as stepping in as CEO, it wasn't fully safe for me to share what was really happening because of fear of whatever, loss, abandonment, persecution, whatever it is, the fears that come up. So I actually mishandled that quite a bit during and right after COVID. And then the team, two team members in particular, Raul and Jesus, who had been with me forever since the beginning of Imaloa here in Costa Rica, Raul and Jesus really sat me down and said, we need to know these things. We want to know these things. And I was able to finally, after years or a year, really speak the truth of what happened from my perspective. And it was it was, it created trust for them, for me to be so vulnerable. And by the way, I don't believe vulnerability is disclosure, which I think a lot of people think that's what it is. Vulnerability to me is having the courage to share something when it could go either way. Like it could actually backfire. That's to me what real vulnerability looks like. And that disclose that sharing with them a year after with Raul and Jesus really had the potential to go you know, to go the wrong way. And it didn't. And I realized that I can actually be truthful and authentic and that it's actually become a big part of our company. Our, our core values, what our top core value, we have seven is we tell the truth. And that's a very distinct phrasing. It's not, we're honest. It's not, we don't lie. It's, we tell the truth and our core values, we believe are who we are when we're operating at our very best, not who we aspire to be. So we tell the truth. And that was a very big thing. As we've come out of COVID and I've retooled the business model, look, I haven't, I've had a very graceful team who's allowed me to make a lot of mistakes and invited that. And in turn, I really invite them and we've created a culture of fail forward, uh, which is really important, not being penalized for failing. But I've, you know, I've definitely had some, um, yeah, I've definitely had some um, misgi- not misgivings. I've definitely had some missteps, I think, in managing. I, I oftentimes kept control a little too close to me uh, as we were navigating out of COVID, did a little too much. Like, you don't want to be, as CEO, you don't want to be the star of the show, and you don't want to be the place where all things and all decisions run through. And I had to learn that the hard way because I thought it would only get done if you know, it would only get done if, if I was holding on tight. And I've learned that that's not the case. And it's been good lessons for me. But yeah, it's definitely been lessons nonetheless. And it's been hard won, you know. Mm. I love the fact that you're so reflective about it and, and quite willing to share. So thank you for that, Jake. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I really love sharing about this. And, you know, it's not always hunky-dory, uh, you know, this is how it works, all of this, you know. Hmm. Jake, I think that's a good place to end. Before we do that, is there any final thoughts or things you want to tell the audience? No, I think I think the most important thing is check in with the body. If you're a leader, even if you're not the CEO, if you're a leader or an entrepreneur, a person who's innovating from within a company, I think really starting to dive into and looking at where where your body comes down on certain things, how you feel. Um learning to live life on life's terms, all these things that have come up for me from living and, and being in a 12-step program. I think, um, yeah, not, not driving results as much as enjoying the thrill of taking action has been a real um, joy for me to learn and to embody, take action, turn the results over, don't live for the results in the results-based business is something that I've learned and, and really internalized. Um, Because we spend our life driving results and to what end? We drive results in our bank account, in our corporate ladder structure, in our family, constantly driving results. What about just taking action, taking the load off and 
learning to listen to the whisper of life. Our life is always talking to us. Um, and I think that these these things, these pieces in a more corporate or entrepreneurial environment is really relevant um, as we figure out a way forward in this kind of post-pandemic new world. It really feels like a new world. And there are certain people that are getting left behind because they're kind of, they went back to what they think is the old world. And and then there are people that are really going to pioneer us forward. And so I think, I think we pioneer forward and we move forward together um, for, you know, with an understanding that there's actually a lot more that our body is indicating to us than we give it credit for. Um, mm. So yeah, thanks for letting me show that. I appreciate you. No, thank you, Jake, for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. And thank you out there for tuning into the Mavic Paradox podcast, where through conversations with my guests just like Jake, we demonstrate that Mavic leadership exists everywhere. I'm Jeeve Germain, your host, and I hope you've enjoyed listening to today's conversation as much as I have enjoyed having it. Mm-hmm.